Hi. Hello. Hello, nice Hi. to meet you. Hi, everyone. Nice to meet you. Sorry, we can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Okay, yes, yes, perfect. Well, um, Joshua, I, I wanted to ask you, do you mind if I try sharing my screen so that if there, if there are any problems, I can check them immediately? Yeah, absolutely. I will um, set you set you all as co-hosts so you'll be able to with a bit of luck. Once I remember where the button is. Um... It's all right. I already made her a co-host. Oh, brilliant. Thank you. Fine. Okay. I'm trying to, to share this because I never remember what I have shared. For example, if I try this, can you see my PowerPoint? Yes. Yes. Okay, yeah. so this is the right window I have to uh, to share. And then I will choose, of course, the uh, presentation mode. So this is where we let, let me see if it works. Okay, now you should see it's um, full screen. Is that okay? Okay. Um, it's, it's is it okay, Joshua? Screen. It's not full screen. Um, for me, it is actually. Oh, hmm. How odd. What about Victoria and, and Sarah? Can you see it full screen or not? Um, I, I mean, can. You can see the slides on the left hand side still, but. The... Ah, that, that's quite strange. So it's just, okay, so maybe I, I can try to close ah, uh, the left hand side and then choose the presentation mode. Is that okay now? Yeah, that looks full screen. Okay, thank you so much. So I have to remember now I, I want to stop my, my presentation. Okay. Okay, so if we just give it a few more minutes and then we can kick things off. How's everyone enjoying the conference this far? Oh, fine. Really, really engaging. <laughs> Good. Well, unfortunately, it's not possible for me to attend all the sessions because um, here in Italy, it's actually 5 p.m. So everything oh. that happens mm. after dinner in, uh, of course, our time zone is uh, difficult to attend to me. By the way, it's um, okay. Yes, I've, I think. I, sorry. Sorry, uh, you're listening. Um, I was just going to say, I think the sessions are being recorded, so you could watch them at a later time if you chose yes, to. Yes, yes. I will shortly. <laughs> yes, they are. It um, saves us on the other side of the Atlantic, staying up, staying up past our bedtimes. <laughs> I did a conference in Greece, and by the time I woke up, the conference was already half over. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Hi, Sabina. Hi, Annalisa. Hi, everyone. Hi. We work together. Yeah. <laughs> oh, how nice. I must say, this is thrilling, really. That's my first time. And there are so many thought-provoking papers. Uh, you know, just don't have time to think about that. And, <laughs> You just need to, to see it all, I mean, watch watch it all over again, just to think it over. <laughs> right, yeah. That's why recordings will be useful, really. Yeah. Yep, no, that That's is the wonderful thing about having them. But anyway, it's um, just come up to, well, 4 p.m. my time, I what it's come up to whichever hour it is in your time zone so if shall we get started um yep 
if yes hi everyone and welcome to celebrities hacks and influencers i'm sure we all know the drill by now but if um i'd like to direct your attention to the raise hand button under reactions for questions or if you put something in the chat i'm one of us will sort of Yes, we can answer that. I, either if you put it in when the paper sort of has the thought pops up or afterwards during the Q&A, which we will have after the three papers. And sorry, little ramble. Um, anyway, um, let's get let's get started. I'll read bios just before people speak. Um, and first up is Annalisa Federici, who Annalisa Federici holds a PhD in comparative literature from the University of Perugia and is assistant professor of English language and translation at Roma Tre University. Her main research areas are literary modernism, especially James Joyce and Virginia Woolf, formal and stylistic aspects in fiction, the relationship between language and psychological processes, as well as periodical and reception studies. She is the author of the monographs, and I apologize heartily to the whole nation of Italy, every Italian speaker for my pronunciation. Il Languaggio della Realità, la narrativa modernista di Virginia Woolf e James Joyce, and in a kind of retrospective arrangement. Essays on James Joyce and Memory 2016, along with critical essays and book chapters on Virginia Woolf, James Joyce, Samuel Beckett, Ford May Oxford, Natalie Sarout, Michelle Boutour. Okay, so um, whenever you're ready. Okay, I am. Uh, thank you so much, Joshua, for this introduction and also for trying to uh, read uh, the, the title in Italian. It was perfect, don't worry. Okay, well, I'm going to bring my screen and uh, uh, please let me know if you can see it correctly. It's a presentation mode. Okay, um, fine. Okay, so let's get started. Well, in the mid-1920s, Virginia Woolf was engaged in a dispute with American critic Logan Purcell Smith on the moral code of accepting lucrative commissions to write for popular journals, or as she called it, writing articles at high rates for fashion papers. Although the argument mainly concerned the choice of a middle-brow periodical like British Vogue as publishing venue for five of her essays, Wolf's position in the contradictory, often vexed, but eventually productive relationship between highbrow modernism and the literary marketplace may be considered as particularly illuminating to explain her active and fruitful engagement with popular magazines, also including Eve, The Ladies Victorial, Good Housekeeping, or Arpus Bazaar, to which Wolf contributed four short stories between January 1930 and April 1939. Despite the fact that her attitude towards these commercial publications, as well as the work she specially crafted for them, could range from mere detachment to downright disdain, Wolf nonetheless tied herself to middle-brow culture for such practical reasons as visibility and financial rewards, which allowed her to achieve the intellectual and economic liberty necessary to receive acclaim as a professional serious writer by also retaining her distinctive eyebrow style. Moreover, she decided to do so by renouncing the stereotypes and ethical restrictions of highbrow modernist aestheticism and choosing publishing venues which represent compelling examples of how high culture often employed mass cultural forms like fashion papers to publicize its values. Harper's Bazaar, in particular, was an upmarket feminine periodical that exploited modernism's distinction and high cultural capital to entice and flatteringly cultivate a leisured, sophisticated, but essentially middle-class readership. 
launched in October 1929, the British edition of the magazine printed lavishly illustrated features on the latest Paris and London, London fashions, etiquette and interior design, society and celebrity news accompanied by alluring photographic records, as well as more culturally sophisticated content such as fiction and essays by leading authors of the time or reviews of recent books, art exhibitions and theatre shows. During the 1930s, Harper's Bazaar offered readers a veritable education in sophistication, within which acquaintance with modernism remained an important indicator of cultural distinction. The showcasing of modernist artists and writers among its pages and the way it fashioned literary celebrities for an audience who would not necessarily have been exposed to them can be considered as key vehicles through which the periodical attempted to disseminate cultural elitism to its affluent readership. On a par with other women's magazines of the interwar period, Harper's Bazaar commodified aesthetic value and ultimately helped to construct and circulate an image of Wolf as a literary icon and a marker of eye culture, while at the same time using this strategy to sell its aspirational readers the illusion of upward cultural mobility. Despite facilitating the mainstreaming of modernism, Harper's Bazaar nevertheless emphasized the perceived exclusivity of modernist literature and art, and at the same time helped to assure the status of prominent modernists as highbrow celebrities by encouraging their reception as established rather than countercultural figures. Although Wolf described her commitment to Harper's Bazaar chiefly in financial terms, and referred to her high quality contributions to the magazine as a quote, pot boiling stories for America written to make money. It seems clear that her own engagement with middlebrow culture did not in the least affect her style as a highbrow intellectual and was indeed typical of the complex symbiotic relationship between the periodical and high modernism. The publication of modernist content um, in the uh, pages of Harper's Bazaar uh, was ultimately advantageous, both modernists seeking to maintain their celebrity status and promote themselves to a wider readership, and to the journal itself, which attempted to captivate and sustain a discerning elite audience by molding and marketing modernist personalities for its readers' consumption. Moreover, both Harper's Bazaar were part of a project then never completed of writing a series of caricatures and much in line with their work of the 1930s engaged with social, moral and ethical issues such as righteousness, the righteousness of penetrating other people's lives and innermost truths in the looking glass, violence and decay in the shooting party, capitalism and anti-Semitism, the touches and the jeweler, and human and non-human worlds in Lapin and Lapinova. Though often considered as non-canonical in terms of both their rather prosaic plots as well as characterization and the commercial public in publishing venue in which they appeared, the stories Wolf wrote for Harper's Bazaar reflect the preoccupations of the last decade of her career and are indicative of the tensions between high and low in modernist culture. As evidence that Harper's Bazaar did not merely publish modernist content but actively shape its reception, it seems particularly interesting to analyze the editorial apparatus, both verbal and visual, which accompanied Wolf's stories and favored her appraisal as a glamorous and sophisticated celebrity writer. This paper, therefore, scrutinizes the way in which the periodical mediated Wolf and her short fiction to its readers, thus shedding further light on the overlooked role of Harper's Bazaar in creating Wolf's reputation as a highbrow intellectual who made frequent incursions into middle-brow territory. When the magazine's editor, uh, Phyllis Joyce Reynolds, printed in The Looking Glass in January 1930, she made sure not only to advertise Wolf's name on the issue cover, but also to employ a captiv captivating subtitle, A Fantasy of Fugitive Dreams, in the contents page and to accompany the text illustration by Cecil Beaton, as well as with the editorial header, which I, I hope you can uh, you can read, but it's very small. Am I dreaming thoughts or thinking dreams? Altogether, suggesting an idea of sophistication and intellectual refinement apt to boost Wolf's reputation as an aloof upper-class author. By means of such editorial apparatus, modernist aesthetics obeys the capitalist ethics of the marketplace according to which the story is packaged and sold to readers as a high cultural commodity that delivers a taste of modernist experimentalism. 
these elusive and elusive paratextual elements employ the language of narrative psychologism and seem to be particularly appropriate on the one hand to the public profile of an experimental writer already known at that time for her brilliant attempts to penetrate her character's inner selves and on the other to the content of the story, which clearly privileges interiority over plot. As is well known among Wolf's short fiction, in the looking glass is extremely interesting in terms of her visual aesthetics and unconventional narrative technique, also for its suggestive title, which may refer to the mental processes activated in both the narrator and the reader by the enigmatic figure of the wealthy middle-aged Isabella Tyson, or to the metafictional device according to which the setting captured by a sort of invisible camera whose eye coincides with a fixed point of view or the observing eye of the unnamed narrator is reflected in the looking glass hanging in the hall of Elizabeth Isabella's luxurious country house. Wolf, therefore, is presented to the readers of Arthur's Bazaar as a sophisticated writer who engages with narrative experimentalism, interiority, elusiveness and verbal imitations of snapshots as the editorial choice to accompany the text with the visual medium of Beaton's illustration also demonstrates. This large line drawn sketch represents Isabella standing in front of the mirror, uh, precisely as she does in the fiction, elegantly dressed and carrying a basket of flowers. However, it curiously includes elements not mentioned in the text, a stack of books, a pair of reading glasses, and a small figurine of a female nude on the whole table, perhaps added, as Alice Wood suggests, to evoke the artistic milieu of Bloomsbury and Wolfe's contemporary reputation as a glamorous but elusive upper-class estate. After a long speculation about Isabella's presumably fascinating life, the, the uh, protagonist's authentic nature is disclosed in an epiphanic moment when, coming back from the garden, her image is reflected in the mirror and the invisible camera placed on the sofa captures and freezes her. In the end, one final snapshot arrests Isabella's figure in a mortal trance, erodes her deceiving appearance and reveals the inner void of a true self. Nevertheless, this act of psychological penetration or unveiling of the truth behind what Wolf calls the mask-like indifference of Isabella's face is not devoid of ethical concerns. Although it was a profound state of being that one wanted to catch and turn to worse, the unnamed narrator subtly, subtly casts doubt on the righteousness of such a forceful, outrageous attempt to disclose one's authentic personality. Moreover, if on the one hand, Wolf alludes to the apparently unproblematic attractiveness of appearances of a blunt reality, such as Isabella's comfortable life, expensive possessions, exquisite clothes and fashionable shoes. On the other hand, she seems to deliver an oblique critique of Arthur's Bazaar's outlook and cultivation of superficial cultural sophistication. The leisured, fashionable lifestyle idealized by the magazine and epitomized by Isabella is an alluring picture which ultimately proves to be a fake. No less complex or ambivalent is Wolf's portrayal of aggressive male aristocracy in the shooting party, printed in the March 9, 1938 issue of British Arthur's Bazaar. The sinister atmosphere of this short story of violence and decay with its brutal denouement is also suggested by the critic font chosen, chosen uh, for the title, while the author's name is in elegant italics in line with the advertisement for rose and appearing on the second page and promoting artistry in weave, form and colour to those who appreciate fine furnishings. In this story, which is based on gender and class oppositions, Wolf subtly ridicules wealthy Edwardian life with its declining extravagance represented by lavish shooting parties. Her attitude, therefore, seems to be in contrast once again with Harper's Bazaar's outlook, its appetite for gossip and high society news at glamorous sporting events. In particular, the author connects the moral decay of the British upper classes, whose passion for imperial conquest is reflected in the, in the enthusiasm for blood sports, with what she perceived as the vicious and essentially masculine practice of hunting. The shooting party, therefore, clearly engages with social, moral and ethical issues and dramatizes the danger of separate spheres, masculine and feminine, or public and private, that Wolf would expose in three guineas. It represents the shooting of large numbers of peasants as an epitome of wanton savagery, 
an indulgence in mass destruction that ultimately recoils upon those who practice it, in this case the last members, Aspire and his two aging sisters of the old Rashley family, portrayed in their stately uh, home. The Rashley women are confined to the house and represented as victims, especially in this final climatic moment when the squire accidentally knocks old Miss Rashley into the fireplace, causing her death. On the one hand, as helpless victims, the two sisters are metaphorically described as clothed and careless, and thus equated to the doomed peasants. On the other hand, the, the old women participate in their brother's perpetration of violence when they cruelly feed troubled by the hunt raging outside and chuckling at the tragic events that befell their family. Though the shooting party relies much more on facts and plots than on interior monologue, the narrative technique employed in this tripartite story, with the first and third sections providing a framework to the central one, is by no means conventional or linear. Wolf's short fiction, therefore, is sold to readers of Alpes Bazaar as a high-quality, sophisticated piece of modernist writing which deviates from mainstream examples of the genre commonly published in commercial women's magazines. It begins and concludes, for instance, with the typical Wolfian figure of an unnamed woman in a railway carriage telling over the story now lying back in the corner, which is obviously the story of the Rashley family narrated in the central part. This enigmatic female figure provides a link throughout the three sections, the initials on a suitcase, the scar on her jaw, and the brace of pheasants subsequently allow readers to identify her as Millie Masters, the Rashley's housekeeper and squire's mistress, re-experiencing the events and contemplating the fall of the Rashley family with a certain grim satisfaction. The idea of a pervasive moral decay hidden behind the glamorous lifestyle of the leisured upper classes connects the shooting party to the Duchess and the Jeweler, which appeared in Arpes Bazaar just one month later in April 1938. Both Oliver Bacon and the Duchess of Lambourne represent caricatures of the type Wolfe had planned to compose since the early 1930s. Moreover, her impulse to social satire is even more disturbing here, considering the explicit anti-Semitism, which represented a controversial trait from the very beginning. As is well known, this story is told from the perspective of a repulsive social climber, who is duped by an unscrupulous noble woman into purchasing fake pearls or into fantasies of social ascension achieved through consumption. The Duchess and the Jeweler, therefore, acknowledges the commercial context of Harper's Bazaar and simultaneously questions readers' practices of consumption. The title page of this story is adorned with an illustration of a loop and pearls scattered across the text, which seems particularly apt to introduce readers to its contents and to recall the numerous advertisements for fine jewellery frequently scattered across the pages of magazine encouraging fashionable behaviour in all domains. This is also demonstrated by the ads for uh, Bird Isles Furnishing Decoration, the Brandy, Deborah Johnson's Supremely distinctive hats for ladies of discriminating tastes, appearing on the following pages beside Wolf's text, which is clearly embedded in a larger framework of consumption. More generally, the illustration is also instrumental in conveying an ideal of elegance and sophistication coveted by Harper's Bazaar aspirational readers, who decide to achieve refinement in fashion as well as the arts. However, while on the one hand, the positioning of the Duchess and the Jeweler within this magazine context seems to imply that its audience can at least aspire to imitate Bacon's social and material ascension by means of that education and sophistication offered by the magazine itself. On the other hand, by addressing an implicit criticism to the fashionable materialism modeled in Alpes Bazaar through his stories plot, Wolf also leads readers to acknowledge that commodities do not always represent character or morality, and that consumers may ultimately be corrupted by their misplaced belief in surface value. At the beginning of the story, all the main markers of Oliver Bacon's acquired wealth, ease, and social distinction are displayed his exquisitely furnished flats overlooking the Green Park and expensive possessions his leisured morning routine and glamorous lifestyle, but most of all his jewels. 
Moreover, his perfect trousers, boots and spats, all shapely shining cut from the best cloth by the best scissors in Saville Row, indicate his affluence as a consumer who can buy uh, the highest quality clothing from the most prestigious tailoring districts in London, which fashion conscious readers of Arthur's Bazaar would surely recognize. However, as with Isabella Tyson, appearances to soon turn out to be deceptive and the atmosphere of spectacle of Bacon's life aligning him with the world of capitalism and consumption is revealed to be just a pretension mask his repressed Jewish identity. In this story, not only does Wolf engage with ethical and moral issues, but she also ultimately compels her audience to identify with the socially oppressed Jew. His stereotypically unattractive body is described in the films, anticipating the animal world of Lapin and Lapinova, which appeared in Arpes Bazaar the following year, though drafted much earlier. It is equally noteworthy that the overdressed, luxurious uh, Duchess of Lambourne is portrayed in no less derisive terms. Her magnitude as a signifier of aristocratic opulence amplifies Wolf's satire of the upper classes common to the Arpes Bazaar stories, while her comparison to a peacock with many feathers extends the animal metaphors employed in the text. In the end, Wolf seems to allude to the fact that Arthur's Bazaar's strategy of selling its aspirational readers the illusion of upward cultural mobility by including high contents alongside low commodities may reveal as delusive as they can strive to ascend into the upper classes and gain cultural as well as monetary capital. Finally, Lapin and Lapinova published in the April 1939 issue, focuses, as is well known, on a sharp contrast between facts and the imagination or the real and the fantasy world jointly constructed by Ernest Tolbun and his wife Rosalind during their honeymoon. This romantic illusion made them feel more even uh, um, than most young married couples in league together against the rest of the world. Uh, over which they hold control by turning all of its disagreeable aspects into fiction. Such rich metaphorical scenario, where Ernest has an alternative identity as a king rabbit named Lapin and Rosalind is a queen hare called Lapinova, persists as a shared private world for some, for some time after the wedding until fantasies definitively collapse. Unlike Virginia Leonard's common use of animal nicknames as terms of endearment, which lasted throughout their marriage, in the fiction, Rosalind becomes more and more emotionally dependent on her husband's and her own alter ego, while Ernest gradually loses interest in sustaining the sham. In the meantime, Ernest's figure acquires increasingly threatening connotations. He is described as a great hunter who chases and traps a white female hare, Rosalind's fictional identity, in a sexually aggressive act alluding to women's subjugation in marriage. At the story's climax in close, uh, Rosalind feels her fantasy world crumble beneath her feet and even experiences a metaphorical death at the hands of her husband who kills her by shattering her illusions. In this story, therefore, Wolf interrogates the validity of fiction and even more subtly addresses ethical issues she also dealt with pervasively throughout her career, such as the unequal relationship between the sexes and between the human and the non-human worlds. While the threat of violence and destructiveness represented by the frequent mentions of poaching, hunting and shooting exposes the disturbing undercurrent hidden beneath romanticism and comedy, the commodification of the animal world is definitely in accordance with the larger framework of consumption within which this piece was originally embedded. In the commercial context of magazine publication, fiction embellished by a drawing of hearts and crowns and leaves encasing the first and also the last letter uh, of the title is showcased as a commodity among others, particularly Peggy Sage's or Barry Clothes for Maternity, advertising two entire columns beside the story's text. In conclusion, Wolf's Harpers Bazaar stories deal with the social and ethical issues which reflect the preoccupations of the last decades of her career and ultimately refer to the author's ambivalent relationship with the literary marketplace, as well as her growing anxieties about the commercialization of high art. By publicizing Wolf's works among other commodities or with the aim of attracting and cultivating an aspiration of readership, Harper's Bazaar molded and marketed Wolf's iconic status as a modernist of series in print, 
contributed to her reputation and in turn benefited from the intellectual prestige accorded to her figure. Wolf's engagement with commercial magazines, far from being unethical or demeaning her stature, as Logan Pearsall Smith would have it, definitely fashioned her into a true modernist icon. Many thanks. That was great, thank you. And um, if we jump, if we jump right on to the next one, Sarah Penn, um, Jacob's Room and the Ethics of Authorship. Are you ready, Sarah? Great, um, Sarah Penn completed her MA in English at Simon Fraser University in 2022. She researches print and manuscript cultures of Britain's long 18th century with particular interests in women's book history, bibliography, and digital humanities. Her most recent project examines, sorry, sorry examines romantic era women's labor and has earned this year's International Research Development Grant for BIPOC scholars from the Society for the History of Authorship, Reading and Publishing, Sharp, and congratulate, huge congratulations on that, Sarah. And um, whenever you're ready. Thank you so much. Hello, everyone from Vancouver, Canada. Um, as my bio says, I'm primarily an 18th centuryist. So I'm joining this uh, conference for the first time. I'm very happy to be here. Very terrified to be here too, but very happy. Um, before I get started, I just wanted to share that I recently uh, caught COVID. So I'm feeling a bit uh, crummy and sluggish and slow. So please excuse me if I have to cough or sneeze or take a glass of water or something. Um, I will be sharing uh, a link to my, um, thank you, <laughs> a presentation paper via chat. Uh, so please let me know if you have any issues accessing it. I originally prepared slides, but I figured that maybe reading the essay alone might be, might be a bit different, uh, especially if I'm wheezing the entire time, you can see what I'm saying. So let me just grab the link for you. <coughs> and then I'll get started. just sent the link to my paper. Um, feel free to read along and if you don't want to, that's completely fine as well. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, all right, so you're familiar with the first quote I'm about to read, so let's just dive right in. Uh, in 1925, Wolf reflected on her disruptive navigation of the writing profession in a letter to artist and interlocutor, James Robert. She writes, I've been engaged in a great wrangle with an old American called Parcel Smith on the ethics of writing articles uh, at high rates for fashion papers like Vogue. He says it demeans one. He says one must write only for the lit supplement and the nation and all the bridges and prestige and posterity and to set a high example. I say bunk. Okay. Favoring the financial rather than artistic vocation of putting pen to paper, Wolf playfully suggests to Raverett that a consideration by Smith of fashion papers like Vogue is a necessary one that would do his literary ambitions a world of good. As a self-described professional hack, she is supposed to disparage from the authorship that was even then widely associated with the mercenary literary labor produced in Britain's long 18th century Grub Street. This district district known for its lowbrow squalor residing scribblers and was far removed from the period's prevailing idealization of the solitary authorial <coughs> genius. Indeed, her comfortable alliance with the literary hack largely believed the predominant skepticism of modernist writers toward commodified artistic works. Wolf's provocative and productive engagement with a commercialized authorial identity often scattered throughout her letters, essays, and diaries, thus consciously guided her career right from her first venture into print. In one sense, her predisposition to commercialize her works 
was not unusual given that she steadily earned her wages as an anonymous reviewer for various journals, such as the Times and the Nation. In fact, she admitted as much in her diaries, carrying my manuscript to the Times, I felt like a hack much in keeping. As Evelyn Cheyan Chan writes, she treats the articles as her currency, as commodities worth and to be sold for certain amounts of money. In another sense, however, Wolf challenged these financial incentives as co-founder of the Baker Press, the publishing house of prestige and prosperity that was particularly selective in whose works it decided to print. The aim of the press, as Wolf articulated, was to publish writing of merit, which the ordinary publisher refuses, and become a vehicle for experimental authors who were on the peripheries of merit commercial publication. Although Leonard recounts that the print disliked the refinement and viciosity, which are too often a kind of fun way growth, which culture breeds upon our literature, the Wolf selection of authors ultimately cultivated a cautious bibliography of aesthetically niche materials from the works of Eliot, Freud, <coughs> Mansfield, Warkey, to name a few, that could be characterized as forming the very hierarchy of so, um, solitary authorship that the Wolfs tried so hard to avoid. The active curation of merit-driven titles by the press therefore largely undermined Wolf's widespread advocacy for enterprising pay-for-hire authors. As an enterprising journalist and experimental publisher of niche works, Wolf is both to ostensibly, ostensibly opposing authorial identities that derived from the 18th century, the scribbling hack and the solitary writer. This presentation joins the many surveys of her ethics of writing to better understand her conflicted positioning within the literary field. In this talk, I'll first trace the ethics that influenced authorship. I'll next discuss her hack-like writing and publishing strategies uh, before exploring Wolf as a solitary author. And then I'll draw on Jacob's room to probe whether she considered hack writing um, as an ethical profession. Rather than dismiss her paradoxical relationship with the literary market, we may view this, these nuanced portrayals as a kind of gateway through which uh, we may glimpse what authorship meant in Wolf's uh, 20th century. <coughs> so uh, Wolf was greatly influenced by the writings of Russell Moore and Leslie Stephen. Her engagement with their works, among others, informed her discussions of politics, feminism, human nature, and morality. Russell's essay is there an absolute good, likely shaped her thinking on ethics and provides a glimpse into what Wolf and the Bloomsco group at large might have been uh, debating during the publication year of J.P. Uh, Russell initially postulated that uh, moral facts were independent of personal feelings, although he later came to believe that the two were largely intertwined. This understanding can be observed in his essay where he dismantles the moral binaries between goodness and badness. Uh, Pigdom summarizes the central argument in this way. If nothing is good because there is no such thing as goodness, then everything is not good. And the same, of course, goes for bad. Judgments about right and wrong are false too, since to say that an action is right in the sense of being the right thing to do entails that it is likely to produce more good and less bad than any available alternative. <coughs> Using these concepts as a starting point for Russell's thoughts and ethics at the time, we can see how they came to contribute to his position in his uh, What I Believe. Since all behavior springs from desire, he says, it's clear that ethical notions can have no importance except as they influence desire. They do this through the desire for approval and the fear of disapproval. All right. This concept of ethics is having no importance except as they influence desire and the reality that Russell sees at present, that there are certain traditional rules according to which approval and disapproval of met about put regardless of consequences, can provide us with an insight into the ethics underpinning Wolf's practice of authorship. On the surface, she exhibits contradictory desires. Her desire for financial security, for instance, uh, sensibly opposes her desire for cultural capital. This contradiction rests largely in the judgments that are made about those who explicitly seek remuneration, presumed hack writers, and those who write for cultural and aesthetic value, presumed audible writers. Although she often passed judgment on what is uh, 
all consider good and bad, writing in your own work. Wolf's position on the topic and the desires that drive this positioning uh, is more ambiguous than her words might suggest. For example, she displays an explicit yearning to earn money for a career to the point where she oversaturates her position, writing in her diaries. I am overpaid, I think, for my articles. Her economic desire was in part driven by the need, as Chan puts it, to live comfortably, which she was fascinated by. In implementing the income she earned, in supplementing the income she earned from her books with the money she earned from her articles, Wolf gained a sense of autonomy and self-sufficiency. However, the central desire for remuneration did not necessarily live up to the cultural capital she craved. It must be confessed that I write great nonsense, she writes to Harriet Dickinson, but you will understand that I have to make money to pay my bills. Although she could happily satisfy her comfortable lifestyle with her earnings, she knew to some degree that uh, the art must be respected and inwardly struggled to navigate these anxieties. <coughs> Her three-day dec um, decade journalism career, um, one that I define as uh, hack, hack work, uh, largely emerged from the connections of family and friends. In her early years, she appeared on Pornhub Magazine, The Guardian, and The Times. By 1908, she signed her name on articles for the first time and proudly aligned herself with her contributions to print. To use Margaret J. Mazzell words, uh, a text with a woman's name can be read symbolically as a public declaration of her possession of intellectual and artistic property. Wolf uh, enthusiastically joined the journalism trade and often expressed her excitement, particularly in relation to her earnings in her personal writings. In 1933, for example, she recounted the first time she mailed up her manuscript. My effort was rewarded on the first day of the following month. A very glorious day it was for me by a letter from the editor containing a check for one pound, 10 shillings. Will further extend her monetary enthusiasm to the publishing practices of the Hobart Press. Although largely concerned with printing this um, artistic merit, the film's uh, material history not only reveals its inevitable association with profit, but also illustrates the hack like enterprise and strategies from which their selection of her records is derived. In 1919, they used a commercial printer for the first time, and by 1922, the firm had printed more literature commercially than not and subsequently assumed a position in the literary field between that of a commercial publishing house, uh, such as the Duckworths, and a niche press that published solely for a coterie of like-minded readers. The Wolves preferred to market their venture as attainable and inclusive, uh, yet their output largely reflected the press's exclusivity. Wolf, however, was not alone in straddling the divide between half and part of the author. This authorial duality, as one of her self -discuss, discusses, uh, was widely accepted and employed by the press itself. Indeed, he frequently discussed the ways in which the journal and the press worked together to test the capabilities of an aspiring author who desired a book contract. It was possible to help the budding and sometimes impecunious Hogarth author by giving him books to view and articles to write. And if one came across something by a completely unknown writer, which seemed to have something in it, one could try him out with articles and reviews before encouraging him to write a book. Leonard here describes the Wolf's employment of a model of authorship that centers on the general Sakak as a literary apprentice. This pointed observation that the development of the press was bound up with the development of Wolf as a writer and with her literary and creative, creative psychology uh, can be more precisely applied to work um, Wolf as a hack writer given that they bound themselves and actively encouraged commodified authorship throughout all stages of the press. <coughs> this form of authorship doesn't stray too far from the 18th century literary sphere that Wolfe displayed such marked ambivalence about at times revering and at times uh, despising as we see with Jacob's room. Although she willingly entered the field of journalism and was certainly encouraged to do so by her father and brothers, she also expressed a distaste for its inclusivity. Given that anyone who could read and write had access to the materials to do so could join the profession. There was no official body, Chan explains, to enforce professional standards that were largely indefinable. Left with few guidelines, aside from deadlines perhaps, the hat pursued mercenary labor as they pleased, a fact not lost on Wolf who compared the uh, money-driven writer with 
brain prostitution in the brain selling trade in Three Guineas. Um, a quote from Tran there. This mindset demonstrates Wolf's ambivalent position, although she initially wanted nothing more uh, than to be included in the library culture in the first place. She would not have been able to do so without first crossing to the lowly position of a journalistic writing. Despite these anxieties, Wolf did view herself as a solitary novelist and enjoy the autonomy that it provided her. In 1922, she displayed her keen interest for this form of authorship, writing, my only interest as a writer lies, I begin to see, in some queer individuality. As Patrick Collier observes, she felt that writing for a general audience demands compromises in the artist's original vision, but by having her fiction published by her own press, she avoided having to compromise her vision and was able to market it in a way that allowed her to attain the critical acclaim that she sought. Wolf, it seems, viewed authorship depending on her authorial position at the time. Um, as a novelist, she's quite different than Wolf as a journalist, and it seems that she separates the two identities throughout her career. She hints as much in a letter to Sappho West, to write differently for different people, just how I pay you differently in my sums, as the editor of the lit <coughs> supplement cut out your improper stories. If Wolf indeed adjusted her writing for different venues, as she suggested, uh, she likely approached her ethical understanding of authorship from those different modes as well. She did not define herself solely by what type of author she was, but rather by what type of author she needed to be uh, to gain access to the literary milieu in which she wished uh, to work, um, she wished her work to appear. Turning now to Jacob's Room, um, a novel that can be situated within Wolf's 20th century vision of an 18th century literary culture, uh, because it brings together various modes of authorship from this era, uh, such as Grant Street hack work, anonymous journalism, and uh, prodigal originality. For instance, uh, Jacob engages in various modes of authorship throughout his transition from childhood to adulthood, uh, including the writing of essays for universities, scribbling in his pocketbook, transcribing plays, and composing letters to his mother. <clears throat> While the products of Jacob's pen display a leaning, uh, however conscious, toward the pure and autonomous art generally valued by high modernism, it's the references which are scattered throughout the novel to texts by authors uh, from the long 18th century that can show insight into the novel's uh, authorial navigation. Uh, Jacob's selection of Lord Byron's works uh, from Anne to Floyd actively engages with these debates. First, Byron embraced a divine sense of autonomy rakish celebrity and increasingly leveraged political experimentalism. And in doing so, epitomized a specific mode of authorship that veers at first glance, far from the hackish writer that later discussed Jacob in his Cambridge year. <clears throat> it is unsurprising then for Jacob to be drawn toward the poet and the elevated literary culture he allegedly represents. Uh, second, although um, Byron's writings were not explicitly present um, amidst the eclectic mix of literature that was scattered in Jacob's room, uh, they likely paved the way for his scholarly ingenuity and taste. Jacob's regular propensity consult to consult just what he likes uh, is later noticed by Richard Bottomley, who, in describing his friend's way, observes that Jacob's taste in literature affected his friendships and made him silent, uh, secretive, um, and only quite at ease with one or two young men of his, of his own way of thinking. <coughs> uh, while Byron's uh, works and literary aesthetics mirror an appeal uh, to Jacob's own experiences, uh, there's also a sense that the poet's enterprising spirit was aroused in Wolf. For example, Byron was not solely confined by the standards of refined aestheticism bestowed upon him in his time, and he actively participated in more commercial spheres. As Michelle Levy notes, he rapidly transitioned from manuscript to private print to more commercial works, and in doing so, moved fluidly through various forms of authorship. His desire to be paid well was further emulated by Wolf. Indeed, in her hard nosed attitude to earning money from her writing, in a lot of use, uh, Wolf bears the prizing resemblance to Byron, whose private papers, like hers, are full of detailed negotiations on price for his work. In other words, Byron's disposal of both the, no the notions of the prodigal and hack writer throughout his life allowed him to embrace a nuanced form of authorship. 
which enabled him to become one of the only members of the Big Six to enjoy success during their lifetime. Given that Jacob is drawn to his powerful side and Wolf herself largely resembles uh, Byron's promoter to F ethos, the novel brings together these two modes of authorship uh, that can be duly reflected in Wolf and her titular character. Um, to conclude, Wolf, <coughs> geez, excuse me, Wolf redefined the hack and solitary author uh, to bring forward a nuanced form of authorship that uh, did not derive from the modernist uh, disdain toward hard works. Indeed, most of her, most of the great solitary authors throughout history came to make a living by their pen, illustrating that the conscious interest in the authorial identity and authorship as a category remains unstable as ever. To paraphrase Leonard, who once wrote that society was a kaleidoscope of human beings, it might be helpful to think of her navigation of the writing profession as a kaleidoscope of authorship, where the hack and solitary authorial identities are tilted toward each other to reflect the spectrum of writing professions manipulated only by the user's rotation and perspective at the time. Thank you very much for that. Thank you, that was marvellous. And I hope that you have a cup of hot tea to hand for your throat. Um, so the last paper of today is from Shauna Ross, the tantalizingly titled Virginia Woolf Influencer. Shauna Ross is an associate professor of English at Texas A&M University, where she researches and teaches on transatlantic modernism and Victorian literature and the digital humanities. Her most recent books include the second edition of Using Digital Humanities, Using Digital Humanities in the Classroom, co-written with Claire Batters Hill, Bloomsbury 2022, and Charlotte Bronte at the Anthropocene, SUNY Press 2020. She is also co-editor of Reading Modernism with Machines with James O'Sullivan and Humans at Work, Histories of Digital Textual Labour with Andrew Pilsch. She is currently at work on a study of popular modernist scholarship conducted through memes and web 1.0 technologies. Wonderful. Um, whenever you're ready, Shauna. Hi, everybody. Thank you for that introduction, Josh, and thank you for those great papers, uh, Annalisa and Sarah. Um, I do have a transcript available in a Google Drive folder where I've also put um, my slideshow because I've got a lot of visuals um, and then a PDF version of that if you don't, um, if you can't use Keynote, which is what I prefer writing my slideshows in. Um, so I have realized um, that my paper's a little long and I don't want to hog the time. So I am just going to sort of um, gloss over the first two pages, which was really just situating this talk um, in the larger project about viral modernism. How, how is modernism seen online? So if you're curious about it, um, you can just, um, you know, look at that later um, on your own time instead of me wasting our collective time now. All right, so let's just get into what we're talking about today. Um, this comes from the section of my work that examines the feminist visual aesthetics of women-centered platforms like Etsy, Pinterest, and Instagram, for whom Virginia Woolf is a central figure. On Etsy, the proliferation of Woolf, Woolf merchandise extends the feminist socioeconomics of a room of one's own and three guineas to unite its customers in a latter-day Bloomsbury coterie. With Etsy and Pinterest, Interest revolves persistently around a certain group of quotations and visuals that recur, especially George Charles Bareford's platinum print of Wolf's profile from July 1902 reproduced on figure nine. The focus of my talk today is largely in plumbing the digital afterlives of Bearsford's portrait, which is at the center of a stunning amount of e-commerce. Figure 10 reveals that of the top 16 Wolf results on Etsy, a, um, let's see, uh, six of them, or 38%, feature the Beresford profile. The first results on Pinterest, shown on figure 11, are more text-heavy, and yet still 26% of the results are Beresford profiles. A quick look at Instagram uh, uh, accounts, of which I picture a representative example in figure 12, reveals a 41% saturation of Beresford profiles, so it's everywhere. 
just like a professional headshot that a successful author might use on all their books, social media accounts and websites, as well as authorized for release on television um, and newspapers, the Beresford portrait is chosen because of its instant recognizability, which aligns new content with the lucrative Virginia Woolf brand. A similar use of Wolf's cultural authority animates instances in which a content creator is directly selling Wolf-related products. With online shopping being far more customizable and responsive than traditional commodity capitalism, niches of literary fandom have become profitable for small and large retailers. And with the relentless, cheap, and fast circulation of the same wolf images over and over and over again, um, fewer captions, fewer references, fewer minutely rendered images, that is less data, less attention, less information is needed to ensure that the culturally revered referent wolf is successfully received by its audience. Hence, all the coffee mugs and sweatshirts emblazoned with the Beresford portrait are quotations like, I am never not thinking of you. In this list, I include products from Anthropology with their Vanessa Virginia clothing line and from Liberty London, like their Bloomsbury Gardens collection of fabric and their $74, I guess now it's 69, it's on sale now, um, Wolf Tapestry Needlepoint Kit figured on um, page uh, figure 13. Touted as being, quote, the perfect rainy day project for the literary minded, it is appended with the Wolf quote, if you do not tell the truth about yourself, you cannot tell it about other people. With Wolf's own words enfolded into the ad campaign, buyers' purchases shore up their literary credibility, connect them with other fans, and testify their commitment to Wolf's feminist legacy. This isn't a criticism, by the way. I love these, project, these products, and I think there's something interesting to be learned from them. And other scholars have investigated Bloomsbury's marketability, like Alan McWeeny and Sue Allison in Bloomsbury Reflections, um, Hannah Leeper, who's called Vanessa Bell the heart of brand Bloomsbury, and Regina Marlowe's uh, Bloomsbury Pie, of course. What I hope to do is extend these scholarly projects into the digital realm by understanding how Wolf is used to sell a lifestyle brand, an affectively rich, visually striking an eminently shareable mode of living that you first see on your smartphone and then are encouraged to manifest in real life by following certain accounts and buying certain products. Although it's easy to dismiss these uses of wolf as being only interested in profit, those of us in academia do to a certain degree leverage wolf and the Bloomsbury group in a brand-like manner. The way we use citations to build networks, the way we curate our book collections to build a sense of identity, and the way we craft our students' reading and writing habits are not entirely opposed to the curation and sponsorship practices of influencers, popular internet content producers who start trends and guide their users' own social media feeds as well as their life philosophies and shopping habits. Indeed, it would not take much anachronism um, to argue that Wolf was a forerunner of today's influencers because she promoted her own aesthetic preferences and lifestyle by way of the high cultural visibility she achieved through her publications, her lectures, her preeminence on the Bloomsbury social circuit, her participation in the Omega Arts Workshop, and her editorial decisions at, at the Hogarth Press. Wendy Hitchmoff's uh, recent book, um, The Bloomsbury Look, um, published by Yale UP with lots of great photos, um, sets the stage for understanding the Bloomsbury group as a visual entity with its own tropes um, and characteristic look. I haven't been able to look at it carefully, but I'm sure it's going to be great and I can't wait to publish about it. Um, anyway, um, so already other scholars like Sydney Janet Kaplan, Andrew McNally and Christopher Reed have implicitly set the stage for observing the similarity between Wolf, Etsy shop owners and tenure track professors by investigating Bloomsbury as a brand of thought. Still, it's undeniable that some uses of Wolf care more about profit margins than others, as is suggested in a sharply written blog post uh, from Blogging Wolf seen in figure 14. It rightly calls out the speed and slickness of the sleight of hand by which literary-minded haute couture, the runway hairdo from Aradon, um, is uh, immediately kind of shades into the use of um, tabloids like Daily Mail to sell and shill um, bargain basement drugstore products. This logic of endless supplementation and substitution gives internet users the greatest numbers of opportunities to shop. There's an, always another opportunity to buy. 
as you can see in figure 15, which shows that Liberty generously allowed um, the creator of their embroidery kit to sell it on her own personal Etsy page as well. So support her, right? Not Liberty. Um, another uh, iteration of the Beresford portrait available on Etsy is by an Australian artist, Nami, um, shown on figure 16, where the literary specificity of Wolf's text dissolves as just a few of her books are reimagined as tracks on a single record. More slippage is uncovered when one considers that only part of this imaginary record, the only part of it that exists is, a, is the label itself, the cover art, and yet the cover art, its only form is as a poster that you might hang on your dorm room wall, right? So it's a fake poster of a fake record, right? Of a fake label. Music and literary fandom practices are further merging as Wolf's portrait gains a new psychedelic background that echoes the Rolling Stones hot rocks um, shown on figure 17. The Etsy artist has reproduced the album's familiar blossoming of concentric profiles by tracing successively wider silhouettes around the famous profile, exagger exaggerating its shape um, in a way that simultaneously draws the viewer's eyes inward to Wolf's lustrous blue eyes and creates the effect that Wolf's interiority is kind of vibrating outward towards the viewer. This portrait also borrows from a famous campaign around contemporary pop star Billie Eilish, as shown in figure 18, who lends to Wolf her plump lips, tear magnified eyes, stylish strong eyebrow, and the wet makeup look trend that um, kind of has been cropping up every summer since um, 2019. Much could be said about the implicit parallels being made between Eilish's trademark look um, of being a heavily stylized martyred saint um, and stereotypes of Wolf as, as a suicidal, mentally ill person, right? So like, I think that's why there's, there's the resonances here. But what I'm really interested in um, is if you put these images together, it shows you how fluidly and persistently Wolfian imagery slips into broader fashion trends by way of social media and e-commerce platforms. The pervasiveness and ease with which this happens is, as we've already acknowledged, partly about knowability. Familiarity secures profit because Wolf is a trusted brand for people who want feminist merch or for people who want to add a respectable gloss to their social media rounds. But I'm trying to avoid snobby judgment calls. Um, you know, I'm not trying to say that this reproduction of Wolfian images somehow lacks integrity or originality. After all, Walter Benjamin was not critiquing the end of the aura, right? Um, so let's continue looking at this image um, as it appears on Instagram. On figure 20, we see how followers themselves encourage content creators to play with it. The user behind the account, Virginia Woolf in Paris, had painted over a variety of novel covers in the exact same way. So her Instagram feed has this style of art over and over again, but it's only this one that caught people's attention. Another account, Virginia Woolf quotes, helpfully superimposes a variety of quotations over the same portrait. This may look like an exercise in reductio ad absurdum, but the number of portraits allows for individualization as the account owner is giving her loyal followers plenty of rebloggable, favoritable options to share. This ensures that the Instagrammer's content has a better shot for going viral. If we disregard the user's motive for a minute and think about the user experience, what the followers see as they scroll and browse, the recurrence of the portrait establishes a palpable rhythm um, within the pages of search results serving a purpose similar to printer's decorations that divide unnumbered sections from each other, um, or even like running headers, which remind you what you're reading, ensuring that there's a metatextual awareness that's hovering over the flow of reading. This rhythmic reproduction of certain quotes and images allows a unique digital wolf aesthetics to emerge, one that unites into a single clickable, shareable shorthand, three very different needs that users seek to fulfill. First, to glamorize nerdy book culture, second, to intellectualize the search for true love, and third, to validate their feminism with a role model unlike um, the Hillary Clintons and Sheryl Sandbergs of today, whose aspirational appeal has been tarnished, not only by the nasty aspersions of misogynists, but also by the compromises they themselves made on their way to public prominence. What is far more appealing to millennials and Gen Zers is Wolf's appealingly antithetical combination of the uncompromising, 
um, which comes through the principles um, in, articulated in her text. And the vulnerable, which is telegraphed by the soulful portrait of averted eyes, porcelain skin, and romantic hair, ever so delicately escaping its low, soft chignon. This accounts reductio ad absurdum, therefore demonstrates how many different insights and radical perspectives coexist inside this interminable, unchanging, unflagging portrait in which her unassuming, fragile appearance hides her sexual and political defiance within plain sight. Something that feminists online have to do to avoid being trolled and doxed. To understand why influences need this image, let's dive a little bit deeper into Instagram itself. Founded in 2010, this visual heavy social media platform was acquired by Facebook in 2012 for a billion dollars in advance of Facebook's initial public offering or IPO. Instagram's photo editing feature, particularly the filters that manipulate light and color to create particular moods have enabled popular users to make a living by curating their lives into a series of heavily captioned and hashtagged images and since 2013, video clips. These visuals are offered by popular users as aspirational content for their followers. The uppermost tier of popular users whose following is the most impressive both in terms of sheer numbers and the level of engagement are called influencers. This term acknowledges the power of inspo or inspiration as followers refit their own social media and purchasing decisions to bring their lifestyles in alignment with that of their favorite influencers. When enough followers are sufficiently inspired, Influencers leverage this fan base to attract free merchandise and corporate sponsorships. In return, influencers offer their feed as advertising space for companies that might display ads to followers outright, or might require the influencer to enfold this advertising into their content directly, a practice called SpawnCon or sponsored content. While many influencers already generated their visibility outside the digital realm, reality stars like the Kardashians, musical artists like Taylor Swift, sports stars like Lionel Messi, they often, um, other users become visible through the platform alone. And so they need the familiarity of images like Wolf to telegraph their brand to new followers. So they kind of hook onto Wolf as somebody who's already famous. Consider the notorious Caroline Calloway, whose focus and promise of sharing her authentic self um, is seen on figure 23. She's responsible for many a boho scene with jarred salads, fluttery dresses and floppy straw hats and Williamsburg lofts and Hamptons-esque beaches until the live blog delivery of 1200 mason jars for an in-person creativity seminar ended in her being widely derided as a scammer and her having to repay a $375,000 advance from a publisher for a memoir she never completed. Cavalier's mason jar disaster served as a convenient lightning rod for questions of authenticity that were beginning to plague the perfectly lit world of influencers. She became the target of investigative journalism and Twitter witch hunts by Instagram users outraged by her inauthenticity her desire to scam her followers, and I'm thinking the way in which that her hyper-visible catastrophe drew wider attention to the economics of influencing. Right, they're embarrassed. Yeah, like, oh no, people are showing our secrets. Don't look at the man behind the green curtain. Some of this anti-Instagram grumbling came from mainstream journalism and can, I think, be chalked up to misogyny. How dare young women create their own visual worlds? How dare they inspire one another rather than focusing on dating apps and swallowing whatever trend was created by a male dominated company? And how dare they monetize the social, textual, visual and manual labors that women have traditionally performed for free? This backlash helps to explain why influencers need a bona fide feminist like Wolf. Still, some of this resistance was generated from within inspo culture itself, especially at SpawnCon, the use of subtly integrated sponsored content instead of obvious ads, which was initially met with resistance from followers. For followers to buy products endorsed by an influencer, they need assurance that the influencer genuinely uses and recommends the product. Their willingness to be inspired is rooted in an imagined intimacy with the influencer, which ultimately relies upon the follower's belief in the influencer's truthfulness and authenticity. This is why the SpawnCon crisis mostly resolved after users reached a consensus that sponsored content should simply be labeled as such, hashtag SpawnCon. Being open about sponsorship restored followers' trust. 
And besides, following along in real time as your favorite influencer racks up sponsorships is probably the greatest hashtag inspo of all. But beyond disclosing business relationships, an influencer can invoke figures of unimpeachable authority, like Virginia Woolf, to reassure followers that there is substance under the pretty surfaces of a well-curated feed. Concerns about who is influencing the influencer dissipate when someone like Wolf provides surety, providing an authentic center for content, while influencers endorse products as if by accident. Products become the peripheral adjuncts for creating a sense of identity that the followers actually intend to purchase. So they are incidental occurrences on the way to curating a life well lived and transmitting corroborating evidence to their own followers. Unlike e-tailers who directly sell, sell Wolf merch, influencers recruit Wolf as an unwitting brand ambassador, the new face of a lifestyle brand that's being curated by the influencer. And unlike the world of e-tail, where serious wolf's, wolf vibes are welcome only, the wolf who is co-opted by influencers is a playful one. Consider figure 26, the more colorful screenshot of an Italian Instagram account about wolf, um, whose tagline is translated by Google. So this is kind of hilarious um, as it's translated. Virginia Wolf was a funny woman. She loved gossip, walking, and the pipe, but I bet you didn't know that, <laughs> right? So we could either translate that as, as either you know, sexual activity um, or cigarette smoking. The known Beresford portrait is counterbalanced by the user's superior inside knowledge, I bet you didn't know that, which we can access if we follow her account faithfully. Figure 27 shows the same account, but this is from their Twitter account, and it's the same, it's the same, uh, same woman who's doing this. It features the Beresford portrait on the cover of Nadia Fusini's In Anocon Virginia Wolf. I don't know if you noticed, she says, but yesterday this book came out. This knowing savvy, assures followers of the account's content. That's not stale, it's not old. Um, and it also adds a welcome playfulness to online discourse. This discourse of wolf imagery that's circulated by women on women-centered platforms. Uh, other sellers and platforms rely more on authenticity. Like Liberty's quote, if you do not tell the truth about yourself, you cannot tell it about other people. But in the world of high-powered influencers, something stranger is happening. Uh, Wolf lends intellectual gravitas, but they retain the playfulness of, say, Orlando, which is to influencers what the Beresford portrait is to Etsy shop owners. Wolf is a genuine icon for high fashion influencers, um, the ones who are not just selling some ad space or gaining a few cents every time a user clicks on a YouTube ad. Um, but these people are getting high paying sponsorship deals to be the face of a brand or curating collections for high end online boutiques. Um, so here I'm thinking of Alexa Chung, um, a journalist and socialite who curated a 100 item Virginia collection in spring 2018. Each item, as figure 28 shows, was photographed in Charleston. Can you believe they got like permission? That's incredible. It was photographed in Charleston um, and paired with a specific wolf quote um, on the fashion site Refinery29, who tells us, quote, we're including these quotes. So while you view the clothes, you can be reminded of some of the wit and wisdom that inspired them in the first place. The Metropolitan Museum of Art's 2020 Annual Costume Institute and Gala about time um, used Wolf's take on Bergsonian Duray and claimed to have Wolf serving as the ghost narrator of the exhibition, <laughs> That's, um, which they say in their uh, Virginia Wolf reading list, which is much longer than my screenshot expects it to. So you've got these fashionistas who are being told exactly which Wolf books to read and why. Uh, as figure 30 shows, this moment exhibit selected some of its items based on their resemblance to Sally Potter's costume for the 1992 filmization of Orlando, um, whose influence has kept Wolf in the world of fashion ever since, um, inspiring collections from Burberry um, in 2016. Uh, figure 32 shows how their clothes are being marketed as being artisanally hand printed, just like Orlando itself. Um, and then Givenchy um, in 2020, um, this particular dress was inspired by gardens at Sissinghurst. So they really thought about Vita and Virginia and their relationship um, to create these clothes. Um, and finally Fendi in 2021, uh, which shows how um, fashion lines that wanted to embrace gender fluidity and gender queer clothing have turned to Wolf and Orlando for inspiration. 
In the fashion world, Virginia Woolf is the influencer's influencer. When I first started my English major a long time ago, uh, one of the first arguments, one of the major arguments that was circulating was Bloom's anxiety of influence. Um, right? So this model of anti-influencing looks backward to establish one's own creativity by proving your originality and your difference from your forebears. I don't wanna be like them. I can't remind you of them. But today's influencers su succeed by affiliation. That's what they're supposed to do. There's no anxiety there. Um, of influencing. Um, they're there to affiliate in order to shape the future online. The practice of looking back to cite Wolf, whether it's in the vein of authenticity or playfulness, it's, it's productive, not anxious. They're not seeking to banish the anxiety of influence. If anything, what motivates them is the anxiety of not being influenced. Okay, I'm gonna stop my share. Thank you, that was fascinating. And I'll definitely think differently about the profusion of uh, wolf themed gift shop stuff I desperately want to buy for a hypothetical office. Um, yeah, I... So does anyone have any questions they would like to raise? If not, there's a there's a comment in the chat by Savina Stevanato, which I think would make a very good first question. So, okay, so. Um, unfortunately, Savina had to leave uh, and she wrote it to me privately. So oh, uh, it was um, just a comment and then she, she said bye because she had to attend another panel. So she oh, sorry. It's, with, um, I uh, don't she's with us now. Oh, could you, still, sorry. could you still tell us what? Um, yes, no, I, I, Why not I, respond? <laughs> sorry, I don't didn't realize it was private. For some reason, I can see it. No, um, no, anyway. no, it was not private at all. No, no. no. no uh, okay. Just uh, anyway, she, um, she, she, she just wrote to me something in Italian uh, because we're colleagues at Roma Tre University and uh, about the, uh, the fact that the paper was interesting. And then she just said hello because she had to attend another, another session. So it was not private <laughs> at all. Uh, it was just a uh, reflection on uh, the, on the importance of uh, uh, the, this connection between high and low in modernism, which is visible from many points of view, and also uh, from uh, from from the connection uh, with the literary marketplace as, that mm -hmm. I hope I I have uh, underlined. Okay. okay so, Could you um, expand on it um, and respond to what Savina said so that we can hear? Yeah, sure. Hear no, it. I I shall read this out. Um, it makes me think about the thorny question about modernis modernism's binary dynamics concerning high culture and mass culture, abstraction and materiality, which Wolf is well aware of in The Leaning Tower, just to mention one writing among others. But she always points to the possibility of an inclusive slash ethical form of balance in both contents and forms. And I guess what I wanted to draw out from that from that comment was the potential for a kind of reparative reading of of this tension i wonder and i want to open it up to all of the panelists i wonder what sort of ethical on a kind of meta ethical level the ramifications of reading this tension in whether in Wolf's sort of publishing history or afterlives are. I think for me, the ethical dimension of what I'm looking at always goes back to the question, um, tri bono, you know, who profits, who gets the money off of these things um, and make sure that it's kind of the, the people who are putting in the work are getting the money out. So that's why I loved um, Annalisa and Sarah, um, how your quotations from Wolf's letters focus on Wolf being like, yes, I want the money, you know, like assuming, like saying, I want a fair price for my labor. 
and being honest about that, I think is profoundly ethical. Um, because if someone wanted to retreat into an image of inaccessible snobbery, uh, and it was never honest about the profit motive, um, then that kind of shuts, shuts other people out from content production. Um, so if you have someone like Virginia Woolf who kind of comes from this elite culture but still really needs to make a buck, that frees other content you, you know, creators in the 21st century to be like, I'm going to create my Wolf merch and make money off of it. And then someone like me comes to that and I don't try to say, oh, that's bad ethics. You know, you can't use Wolf like that. Um, because as um, Annalisa and Sarah have shown, um, Wolf herself provided an example of people who are unashamed about the money that they're going to get from their activities. Oh yes, I, I totally agree with you because uh, uh, she often recorded in a diary uh, the amount of money that she earned by really selling these stories. For example, for the two half a bazaar stories, the, um, and in particular, if I remember correctly, the, the shooting party and the Duchess and the Jeweler, who, which appeared uh, just one uh, month um, before and after the other, she got something like $1,000, which is I think are a big, a huge amount of time considering that we're talking about the, the end of the 30s. Uh, and so she, she was not ashamed in a certain way of confessing her pleasure at uh, uh, earning so much, so much money. And she often recorded in the diary all the, the beautiful items that she uh, uh, could uh, actually uh, buy thanks to the, the, the revenues uh, uh, of this book. Publication. So um, I think that um, Wolf is uh, the, the first to recognize that this, uh, what is normally perceived as a watershed between prestige and money, uh, so between the TLS, for example, or the uh, other prestigious highbrow publications, and what is normally considered as lowbrow publishing venues, uh, uh, should be should be abandoned because prestige and money could also uh, go uh, side by side, and probably she it was both that she was trying to uh, achieve. We're thinking. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm thinking of the, uh, was it the Persian cat and she talks about in, in a room of one's own or professions for women, the first <laughs> thing she bought with her very first yeah. paycheck as a writer. Yeah, I was, I was just going to jump in and say that it, it seems that <clears throat> her um, uh, sort of ambition, her, her motive, her, her wish to make money always seems to be a sort of central desire for her wish to work. And that's something that we see also in, in the Hogwarts press as well. I mean, she's not the only one that um, seems to sort of use that kind of um, monetary, that apprenticeship sort of style. Um, Leonard also lists other writers as using those, those kind of um, monetary motives as well, like um, T.S. Eliot and, and Robert Graves and um, uh, those writers as well. So um, it's definitely something that we, we see beyond a wolf as well. And um, uh, something that I think all of our papers are kind of trying to navigate, um, especially and Elisa and I, it seems like we're both trying to find that middle ground between high and low culture. And um, I, I love how we both started with the same quote first. <laughs> that, that was nice, so I didn't have to read out my the quote, but everyone did it again. But, um, I wanted yeah. to um, thank Shona for pointing out to us so many uh, interesting uh, occurrences and appearances of Wolf uh, on the World Wide Web and also on websites were, uh, with which uh, she, she probably would never be associated. So uh, as it was uh, considered as in a certain way strange and surprising at the time 
uh, to read a wolf essay or a wolf short story uh, in, in a paper uh, in which commodities were advertised. So it seems so incredible to us nowadays uh, uh, at the beginning of the uh, 21st um, uh, century uh, to see wolf advertised uh, as merchandise really uh, on websites selling many other things. So uh, uh, it, it means that uh, we really need to uh, readjust our ideas and uh, uh, um, clearly <laughs> uh, uh, breach this gap between high and low uh, uh, in modernism. Do you think that it's possible that this is a, um, a tree that sprouted out of um, Brenda Silver's Virginia Woolf icon, where she's tracing it back to things like the um, uh, the poster of Woolf as an advertisement for um, Bass beer, and um, you know her image on the wall in a movie and so forth, and that this is um, like how a next generation is um, spawned, if you will. <laughs> And it goes back so beautifully to what Annalisa said about um, her publications in, you know, endless photographs or not photographs, drawings of women who are wraith thin and 11 feet tall. <laughs> uh, and, you know, you're supposed to look like that and spend, you know, eight pounds on um, that, that real interesting outfit. <laughs> it seems like she's been involved um, in this public consumption. <laughs> for during even her life. Oh, it's just, I'm, I'm curious about a conversation that seems to fit with all three of your brilliant papers. It's like fabulous lineup. Thank you. And now I'm, I'm thinking of those images in, in Vogue where Wolf was, um, you know, I wouldn't say bullied, but she was, you know, convinced to put on her mother's dress and, and you could see uh, viscerally um, how she could not fit that dress of her mother's. It almost seemed to kind of hang off her as if it was a, a hanger. So the, the thinness of Wolf and that being, um, that harmonizing well with some of the really unhealthy patterns of the fashion sample size zero. I have not been thinking about that at all. And I really appreciate that uh, because in my desire to take these women seriously and mm -hmm. you know, not put my appreciation of Wolf over theirs, um, I had not thought about that toxic element there. So I really, I appreciate that. And I have to think about about why Wolf's thinness might also create an appropriate icon. There's, there's also that horrendous um, depiction of um, her and Sylvia Plath and several other women who took their own lives dressed up to the nines while uh, walking into a river or putting their heads into a, um, you know, an oven. Um, so there's like this creepy, um, necrophiliac kind of ob obsession about Wolf in that sense too. It's just really, really interesting stuff. I'm hoping that you're thinking about publishing it and I'm going to make a pitch that the miscellany is always open and embraces submissions that are eight pages long to 10 pages long. <laughs> so. If you're interested, please send me something. Thank you so much. I, I will do so. Um, yeah, and what and what you were saying about that, I'm not aware of those images. I, I will look them up. And I do think that does harmonize with that that portrait of Billie Eilish, um, who's often sure. seen as this martyred saint figure. And there, there's definitely something very disturbing, as you say, necrophilic um, in that valorization of certain aspects of Wolf's identity. And that makes it even more powerful that some of these users, like the Italian account, are so much more playful and joyful. Mm -hmm. um, and Annalisa, you used that word pleasure as well. And I mean, that's very, very important because there, that's not an austere version of Wolf, but a femininity where you can em embrace pleasure rather than um, with, withholding. And There's also a really, oh, I'm sorry. sorry. Please, please, Farah, please. Nope. 
you, you continue because it was I was going to say something about Sarah's paper, so totally off topic. Um, uh, Shona made me think about uh, the fact that very often we uh, associate pleasure, we do not associate pleasure with Wolf, uh, but she actually was extremely, she was delighted at uh, not only the, the, the revenues, but also uh, the, the popularity, the, 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 the popularity, for example, she also noted down, I can't remember correctly if it was a diary or in a letter, uh, the, the pleasure, for example, at uh, the, uh, the, the fact that Slapin and Lapinova was accepted uh, by uh, the her, her American uh, agent. And she was also furious when a couple of stories that uh, she also wrote at the request of Schombrun, uh, who was an um, American agent, were suddenly uh, uh, rejected by by the magazine so it's not some, something just related to uh, uh monetary concerns or, or revenues but also related to popularity and this is again something that we should start uh, uh, uh associating with wolf uh, um, more often than we did in in the past uh, uh when we used to uh, think about her just as a highbrow uh, writer who scorned uh, popularity and uh, revisionist scholarship has really demonstrated that uh, modernists in general did not score popularity as uh, we, we we used to uh, uh, we used to think. So uh, again, it's a new way of reading and uh, changing our uh, um, um, established views. Uh, so please, Barra, now. No, so I was. Um thinking that there's a kind of intriguing connection between Wolf um, being happy as a hack <laughs> uh, and what um, Shauna is talking about in terms of the influencers are hacks <laughs> without a doubt and it makes them happy because there's a flow of cash and it's sort of like the, um, the strange sort of continuity um, of Wolf being involved in something that now, you know, she would never have imagined um, the idea of something like Instagram or Twitter or um, any other, you know, platform like that. But it's, it's about um, publishing right across the board. And so I was wondering, Sarah, if you, if you see um, some sort of connection in that hack factor. Yeah, I think I think Wolf is, of course, drawn to the monetary aspect. I think she's. Um, it seems to me that she really likes that sort of um, independence, and I see that very much in, in sort of the influencer lifestyle. They can kind of set their own schedules and, you know, do what they like at, at their own time. Basically, whatever they like, as, as long as you have that, you know, the spawn con sort of aspect to it. And I feel like Wolf would have been. You know, very um, kind of impressed with that to a point. Um, yeah, again, I, I can't fathom what she would have said if she saw photos of herself on uh, pinned on um, Instagram or something. And that, that's I wouldn't ha know how to react to that myself. Um, so yeah, I think that independent uh, quality, the the fact that she um, very much uh, wanted to just rely on her own wits. And it seems like she sort of um, entered, ventured into print, um, sort of into the hack journalism side of things through her through her family. And maybe at, at one point she wanted to, you know, have, have that independence for herself too. Um, I'm also thinking <coughs> of Shauna's um, lovely questions here. Um, I, I have not seen hacks. <laughs> that sounds fascinating. Um, full disclosure, I actually just got Netflix uh, last year. So I'm very um, behind on all things fun, it seems. Um, I'll have to look that up, but um, is that like a, a reality? Um, um, it's a scripted show. I think it's on HBO Max. Uh, and it's a young woman who considers herself a highbrow writer for prestige TV. And she gets um, she gets fired because of a Twitter, uh, a very tasteless Twitter post that she 
that, that she published and was fired from this prestige TV job. And she's kind of forced to work as a joke writer for this female comedian who's kind of like based on Joan Rivers. And she feels like, so she's young and the Joan Rivers comedian woman is from kind of the boomer generation. And this woman's a, a millennial. So it's about these two forms of women creative figures who are forced to join each other um, and create these jokes. I, I think it's, and yeah, it's called hacks because they're both hack writers. Oh, that sounds funny. <laughs> <laughs> your second point um, <coughs> too about, um, I guess the 18th century uh, relationship <coughs> to uh, Virginia Woolf, excuse me. Um, I, I think that we, I think for those of us who study like the history side of things, I think we have sort of a sort of love-hate relationship with Virginia Woolf, <laughs> sorry. Um, but I think this is, you know, largely because her understanding of Britain's, um, Britain's long 18th century is um, informed by her own perception of women's book history. And I'm thinking here of um, the common readers in the lives of um, the obscure, where she was kind of observing like the flaking, the flaking books, kind of collecting dust. And um, she's you know, observing these um, woman authored books on, on the shelves, like why, um, why disturb her sleep, um, she says, and um, she, she kind of has this, um, uh, <clears throat> uh, how do you say it, um, lopsided or understanding of the recovery of their literary history, and uh, that's something that uh, we kind of um, we, we like to um, point out <laughs> a lot, um, and I'm, I'm thinking too of, um, you know, A Room of One's Own published shortly after The Common Reader, which kind of shows another complicated, kind of construct a complicated understanding of um, women's literary history um, and how she sort of um, reduces it and, and kind of mentions that. Um, women um, seem to write very little and, and that's, um, of course that, that's not that's not quite true so um, I would say she has a sort of fascinating um, understanding of 18th century women um, that could always be more explored and um, I, I like her sketches of um, you know Jane Austen and, and Pilkington I think those are kind of the jumping off points um, studying in the classroom. Um, I, I um, yeah, I also, you mentioned that you were, <coughs> um, co-wrote a book with Claire, um, Shauna, and I just wanted to, to mention that she, I spoke to her way back when I was writing a proposal for this conference. Um, she was lovely and, and so helpful and she mentioned that wolf scholars would try to uh, convert me into the wolf world. And I must say that it's, uh, it's been so lovely to, to be here and to meet everyone. And I can feel the, the conversion kind of working a little bit um, in this 18th century fan. Uh, so thank you for that. That kind of answer. Um. Just real quick, I have to go open the um, break room. So if you want to keep this session going, we totally can. Um, but I'll just need to make somebody else the host if anyone mm -hmm. would like to. OK, um, I'll make Joshua the host. Yes, to? no, I, I was about to say that it's um, <laughs> coming up to the lunch break. So if anyone. So yeah, I'm ha very happy to keep this open, but if anyone wants to pop off, get a well-deserved bite to eat. Yeah, we were, we were told that we have only 45 minutes instead of an hour, so we probably should disappear. <laughs> Perhaps, yes. Because now it's uh, 41 minutes. Uh <laughs> hmm. Yeah, in that case, um, thank you all for a really fascinating session. I've. 
Thank you. Learn to Thank you. rate the all. Okay. Wonderful, wonderful paper. wonderful paper. Thank you so much, um, also, for your responses and enjoy your lunch. It's almost aperitive time here in Italy, so everyone will be <laughs> enjoying <laughs> their own uh, drinks and, and food. So, bye. I'll see you. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye.